theme for the message this morning titled, Repentance is Critical for Knowing God. Repentance is Critical for Knowing God. Acts 17, verses 30 to 31, as we heard, read, said, In the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given brief proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This morning I wish to look at Paul's method of engagement or his method of evangelism with the Areopagus, the high court in Athens at the time. His method of engagement or his method of evangelism can be summarised in three parts. The first is about the process of finding some initial point of connection with the audience. Second involves the process of explaining the Christian faith. And thirdly, it involves the process of calling people to repentance. All three are necessary and important parts of the process for helping people to come to know God personally in and through Jesus the Christ. This morning I wish to particularly emphasise the importance of repentance for how it is that we come to know God. Just before looking at the process or the method that Paul goes through, let me just say a few things about the context. Paul had encountered conflict as a result of his preaching in a number of different locations, in Thessalonica and Berea in northern Greece, and had been carried to Athens as a place of safety. The book of Acts tells us that while he was waiting for his companions Silas and Timothy to arrive, Paul was distressed to see Athens full of idols. So Paul went to the synagogue and into the marketplace on a number of occasions to preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some Greeks who heard Paul speak openly and publicly about the resurrection of Jesus Christ took him to a meeting at Areopagus, the high court in Athens, to explain himself. The Areopagus literally meant the rock of Ares. Ares was the ancient Greek god of war. He is one of the twelve Olympians, the son of Zeus and Hera, and in Greek literature, he often represents the physical or violent and untamed aspect of war and is the personification of sheer brutality, in contrast to his sister, the armoured Athena, whose functions as a goddess of intelligence include military strategy and generalship. The Book of Acts mentions a group of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers that debated with Paul, some saying, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and his resurrection. Who were the Epicureans and Stoics? The Epicureans and Stoics represented two of the main schools of philosophy in ancient Athens. Both attempted to escape the futility of life with their particular form of philosophy. The Epicureans taught a way of life devoted to excessive personal indulgences on fleshy pleasures, while the Stoics taught self-discipline and self-denial. The Epicureans taught that God either does not exist or is too far removed from humanity to influence human beings. While well, the Stoics taught that God is in everything, like an impersonal force or an impersonal power. Simply to say that the people that were present at Areopagus were men of great learning and of high philosophical understanding. They saw philosophy not simply as an academic exercise, but they saw philosophy as a way of life. So how does Paul engage with this upper class, intellectual men who loved 
all things philosophical. Firstly, Paul finds a point of connection with his audience. Noting that Paul does not seem to be nervous or intimidated by the intellectuals in his presence, he goes straight to the point. And the first point that Paul raises, designed to attract the attention of his audience, is that Paul begins by praising them for being religious. People of Athens, says Paul, I see that in every way, not just in some ways, but I see that in every way you are very religious. That is, Paul is affirming the fact that they are committed to their religion, and that is a positive thing. Secondly, Paul highlights the fact that they are a people who worship God, or many gods. Even though they are ignorant of the God they worship, it is clear that they nevertheless are people who worship. And Paul makes the point that he has taken the time to actually walk around their city and that he's also taken the time to look very carefully at their objects of worship. So what Paul said, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What can we learn so far from Paul's method of engagement? Paul does not trash their philosophy as such. He sees it as, as a starting point to entering into to the deep questions of life regarding God and the meaning and purpose of life. Similarly, by implication, before we can share something about our faith, it is important that we take the time to actually know something about what other people generally think and believe. Do not be quick to correct people. It's important that we listen very carefully. Take the time to actually look around and investigate what is at the heart of someone's philosophy so as to find some common ground from which to have a genuine and open conversation. And this is where Paul begins. He begins by meeting them on common ground. And the common ground is religion, worship, and God. The second process, in terms of Paul's method for evangelism, is the actual sharing of our faith, the act of explaining what the Christian faith is specifically about. And Paul's entry point for speaking is the fact that they themselves have expressed that they do not know the God that they worship. Hence the reference to an unknown God. So Paul wants to tell them exactly who this unknown God is. That is, Paul wants to name the unknown God. He does not want to speak generally about religion, and he doesn't want to talk about worship, though this was his starting points. He wants to get straight to the point regarding who this unknown God is that they worship. I'm not going into the specific details regarding what he said. Highlighted some of the, those things last week. But simply to say that it was at this point that Paul begins to lay out clearly his argument for who God is as the creator of the world and how he can't be reduced to living in man-made temples and so forth. And then he links this to the resurrection of Christ from the dead and how he will be our judge at the end of time. Paul here uses sound logic and good reason for trying to explain to them about who God is. Christians are often charged for blindly believing in the Bible without using our minds. But here Paul uses very sound logic and good reason to explain who God is, and why he is not an object of worship, but a personal being whom we can know, come to know, and to love. To put it another way, reason and logic are not simply the tools for atheists, and faith the only tool for Christians. No, both reason and logic and faith, these things are all for human beings alike. 
we have access to all these tools, reason, logic, and faith. As Christians, we're not simply called to call people to faith without any sound logic or without any reason. No, we are called to use good reason and good logic as well to highlight why faith is not an irrational decision but a perfectly reasonable and rational thing to do. So when we call people to step out in faith, in other words, we're not saying that this is an act of blind faith, but a decision based on sound reason. What is the sound reason? The sound reason is that we know God. He's not unknown. We know him. And because of the fact that we know God personally and intimately, we have confidence to entrust all of our lives into his hands and into his loving care. What is the opposite to trusting God? The opposite to putting our faith and our trust in God is to put our faith and our trust in ourselves, in human beings. But as you know, we will always let one another down because we are imperfect, we are sinners, we are broken people because of our sins. But in Christ, we are always upheld. Christ never lets us down. It is why it is much more logical and reasonable to trust in this God whom we know to be perfect rather than trusting in our own human intelligence and wisdom. The other point that needs to be raised here is that often people feel that they do not know enough about God to be able to share about him to others, particularly to people who we think are more intellectual than ourselves. But that should never be a stumbling block. Our primary aim as Christians is to bear witness to the fact that God can be known that he's not an unknown God, but that he can be personally known in and through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand just how radical that statement is, that God can be known in and through Jesus Christ. We do not need to try and work it out or try to guess who he is. We can know him personally and intimately in and through Jesus Christ. That is, God is not simply an all-powerful figure in the heavens. No, he has come down to us personally, in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, precisely so that we can come to know him personally. And so as Christians, we are simply called to bear witness to this simple but very profound truth that God can be known. And that is what Paul is simply seeking to do at this point, to lay out clearly, as clearly as he can, that God is not unknown, but that he can be known in and through Jesus the Christ. The third and important part of the process of evangelism is that Paul calls them to repentance. Repentance for their ignorance in worshipping an unknown God. Paul says in Acts 17, 30 to 33, In the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he would judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this, to everyone by raising him from the dead. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that ignorance or lack of knowledge is no longer a sufficient reason for their unbelief. The proclamation of the Christian message brings this time to an end so far as those who hear the gospel are concerned. They no longer have any excuses for their ignorance. God was prepared to overlook their ignorance in the past. but Now, says Paul, he will no longer do so. God calls on all people 
everywhere to repent. The urgency of Paul's appeal for repentance is underlined by his claim that God has appointed a day of judgment to the world. Using Old Testament language, Paul emphasizes that it will be a righteous judgment. That is, he will judge the world with justice. Yes, God, through Christ, will judge, but he will judge with justice, so there is no need to fear this concept of judgment. It will be conducted by God, says Paul, it will be conducted by God's agent, a man whom he has appointed. And the appointment of the judge has already taken place and it is, and is to be seen in the fact of his being raised from the dead by God. And so with these thoughts and these words, Paul reverts to the themes of his earlier preaching in Athens where he specifically talks and preaches about Jesus and the fact of his resurrection from the dead as the final proof that God can be known. The point I wish to particularly highlight here is the importance of repentance. Calling people to repentance is a critical and necessary part of the process of evangelism. Why? The human intellect has a natural tendency to fall in love with its own powers of reasoning. Knowledge puffs, as I've highlighted in previous sermons, Knowledge puffs, as 1 Corinthians 8, 1 puts it. Noting that Paul, again, is talking here to intellectual, intellectuals. He's talking to philosophers and deep thinkers. So how do you get through to intellectuals, philosophers? I think the key is not to try and suggest that sound reason and good logic is not important. And that all we need, all that we need is faith to see the risen Christ No, the key lies in our understanding of the word repentance. Repentance is not simply a call to repent of our sins. It is a call to a radically different way of thinking and a call to a radically different way of seeing things, a total U-turn or an about turn. If you were heading in one direction, a call to repentance is a call to turn around and go in the opposite direction. Have you ever tried to work out a problem but couldn't because you suddenly realised that you've been looking at the problem the wrong way? Well, that is something of what true repentance is all about. It is recognising that simply drawing knowledge from our minds and from the world in which we live will only take us so far. We must therefore repent and abandon our old way of thinking And look beyond our minds to the source of all knowledge. The call to repent is a call to stop drawing knowledge and information from the world for the sake of knowledge's sake. That is, for the sake of just knowing something, for the sake of knowing it. Paul says we must look to the creator, the source of knowledge, the source of life, the source of all light. It is Paul's primary goal in terms of his engagement with the philosophers and the intellectuals to try and help them to see this point, that they should be looking to God, the source of all knowledge, rather than looking at their own seemingly intelligent minds. And Paul is, is doing this, or using this method, because he knows that once they come to know God personally, then they will be able to see from then on everything from a radically different light. The process of repentance then in the context of reaching out to intellectuals and philosophers is not to try to trash the importance of knowledge, but rather to help them to know the source of all knowledge, God, who who has now revealed himself to us in and through Jesus Christ. Knowledge for knowledge's sake is futile. But knowing God, the source of knowledge, first, radically changes not just how we know, but why we know what we know. It is why Proverbs 9, verse 10, gets it absolutely right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. 
Evangelism today is critical because evangelism tends to be a dirty word in the church today. But it is critical that we continue this task of evangelism, trying to convince people that God can be known. And as from our Bible reading this morning, there is much to learn from Paul's method of engagement in terms of the three things that I've highlighted One, the process of finding some initial point of connection with the audience. Secondly, the the importance of of explaining clearly the Christian faith. Thirdly, the process of calling people to repentance. Noting particularly today that repentance is about a totally different approach to knowing. It, It first seeks to know the creator before knowing anything else. Because once we know the Creator, all knowledge falls into its proper and rightful place. May all that we know be used for the service and the honour of God alone. Amen.